From Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, ULA and Lockheed Martin Commercial Launch Services present live Atlas V launch coverage. At Space Launch Complex 3, an Atlas V rocket is fueled and ready to launch Worldview 4 for Digital Globe. Hello, I'm Matt Donovan and I lead ULA's Human and Commercial Services Propulsion Team. I'm joining you live on this Veterans Day from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. At this point, the launch team is not working any issues and we're proceeding towards liftoff a little after 10.30 a.m. Pacific time this morning. We'll have a 15-minute launch window to accomplish today's launch. The launch count is currently in a planned 30-minute hold. There are two planned holds in our nearly seven-hour launch count. The holds give our team additional time to resolve any issues prior to entering the terminal count. A few guests will join me later in today's show, including Digital Globe's Tanir Kadanas. Among other things, Tanir and I will discuss Digital Globe's imaging capability and how they assisted firefighters here at Vandenberg as they coped with a series of wildfires. I will also be joined by Sydney Owens from satellite maker Lockheed Martin. The 30th Space Wing's weather officer, Jennifer Hayden, recently provided us with the final forecast and today's weather is within the launch commit criteria. Our probability of violating launch constraints is 0%. Ground winds out of the southeast at 5 to 8 knots and the temperature here is 72 degrees Fahrenheit. With that very favorable forecast, we are proceeding towards a planned T0 of 1030 and 33 seconds Pacific time. This is Atlas Mission Control. We're at T minus four minutes in holding. Today's flight will deliver the Worldview 4 satellite to near a sun synchronous orbit. Let's learn a little bit more from Digital Globe's engineer Martin Taylor as he explains some of the technical details of Worldview 4. Worldview 4 is really the evolution of Digital Globe's industry leading constellation. Its weight and size are roughly equivalent to a pickup truck much of which is taken up by the camera. Flying at an altitude of 617 kilometers, or about the length of Florida, Worldview 4 will be able to image with 30 centimeter resolution. Worldview 4 can collect 680,000 square kilometers per day, or about the size of Texas, and simultaneously downlink the images while collecting. Orbiting at the same altitude as Worldview 3 will allow us to more than double the revisit rate of any point on the Earth. These capabilities make Worldview 4 an exciting addition to our world-class fleet. Worldview 4 is the 66th Atlas V mission and the 112th ULA flight. This morning's mission uses the Atlas V 401 configuration. The rocket is built in Decatur, Alabama and Harlingen, Texas, and the Atlas V in its 401 configuration has a booster powered by the RD-180 engine, a Centaur powered by the Aerojet Rocket Dyne RL-10C1 engine, and a 4 meter diameter fairing. Today's count began earlier with rollback of the MST. We'll see that coming up, but first I had a chance to tour the launch pad before the roll. Let's take a quick look at things that have happened over the last couple months to get us ready for launch. The spacecraft arrived at Vandenberg on July 28th and then was encapsulated inside the fairing on September 2nd. On September 7th, the fairing was transported out to Space Launch Complex 3 and mated to the Atlas V. That activity completed the last major processing milestone before the final launch preps began. Final preparations take place here in the 260-foot tall mobile service tower at Space Launch Complex 3. Weighing nearly 11 million pounds, the MST provides support for the rocket and the payload, as well as protection from the weather here on the California coast. About four and a half hours before launch, the MST rolls from the service to the park position. The MST is moved about 250 feet southeast of the rocket, and that trip takes about 20 minutes. The Atlas V overall stands about 19 stories tall and weighs about 750,000 pounds fully fueled. To get the vehicle away from the pad, the RD-180 produces more than 860,000 pounds of thrust. 
With the MST rolled back, the team will complete the final preps and then clear the pad for launch. Today's flight will deliver Worldview 4 and 7 CubeSats, known collectively as Enterprise, to orbit. The rocket will take a southwesterly heading away from our launch pad here at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Let's take a look at what else we can expect to see following liftoff. The following profile details the important events of this mission using approximate times. Five, four, three, two, we have ignition and we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance, Atlas V rocket. The Atlas RD-180 main engine ignites to lift the vehicle away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Atlas begins its initial pitch, yaw, and roll maneuvers to attain the proper ascent profile and minimize aerodynamic loads. The Atlas V reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 79 seconds. At 87 seconds, the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure. Approaching booster engine cutoff, the Atlas V is burning propellant at the rate of 1,600 pounds per second, traveling at approximately 8,700 miles per hour, and located 77.5 miles in altitude and 140 miles downrange. Booster engine cutoff occurs approximately four minutes after liftoff. Six seconds after booster engine cutoff, the booster stage is jettisoned. The first Centaur main engine start takes place 10 seconds after booster separation. The payload fairing is jettisoned 4 minutes and 27 seconds into the flight. Centaur main engine cutoff occurs at 15 minutes and 36 seconds. At 19 minutes 15 seconds, Centaur releases Worldview 4 for Digital Globe. At 2 hours 12 minutes, the first of four CubeSat deployments begins. The second deployment occurs at 2 hours 15 minutes, followed by the third at 2 hours 22 minutes, and the final deployment at 2 hours 25 minutes. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus four minutes and holding. At ULA, our mission is to save lives, explore the universe, and connect our world. And we're proud to have launched the first three sat Worldview satellites. Worldview 4 is a sister satellite to Worldview 3, which has been in space for about two years. They have the same resolution capabilities, seeing details down to 30 centimeters. That resolution on Worldview 3 enables it to change lives on Earth through some incredible projects like this Associated Press investigation. There's a perception that slavery is something that's just in the past, part of our history books. But the reality is there's more people enslaved today than any other time in history. Over 30 million people and I think that in the West in particular, it's not really understood or acknowledged. In the summer of 2015, we fielded a call at my office from a reporter at the Associated Press, which wasn't unusual because we provide images to the media all the time. But this story, we knew immediately this story was different. Martha Mendoza, the reporter, and a team were working on a months-long investigation to expose the extent of the exploitation of human beings in Southeast Asia in the fishing industry. Men are tricked into working on these boats, and they're essentially enslaved for decades. They think they're going to get paid, but they're kept at sea, captive on these boats. In the times that they do go to shore, they're kept in cages. Commercial boats would rendezvous with slave boats and exchange fish that would eventually end up in the United States supermarkets. This exploitation of human beings, everybody was aware, but they couldn't catch them in the act. These commercial boats were very crafty and new, 
that they had to leave the territorial waters where they were allowed to operate and they would turn off all their tracking devices so they were essentially invisible in the middle of the ocean. Martha and her team had a body of evidence based on ground information, people that had actually escaped from slavery. She needed a smoking gun. They needed something tangible that they could look at that was unrefutable, that would create action. We own and operate satellites and ground infrastructure. An entire system that allows us to see any spot on the surface of the Earth against very short timelines at very high resolution. We knew we needed the best ammo that we could put against this problem, and that required the best satellite we had. We actually put Worldview 3 on the task because it required 30 centimeter imagery to actually meet the needs of the mission. Martha and her team were doing a good job of narrowing the search space that we should be looking at given that they were hiding in the middle of the ocean. And so we were tipped off in terms of the direction that they were going in, but we still had a really wide area to look at. So what we had to do was guess. When the satellite came overhead, that initial review, we came back with nothing. And it was empty ocean. So we tried again. The second collection came in. Our analyst looked at it. We knew we had the shot. The image was stunning in its clarity. Even we were shocked. Based on photos that had been taken when the commercial boat was in the harbor, we could figure out, we could measure the length and the width of the boat, the height of the mast. We could see details in this image that were so strong. For example, the cargo holds were open on the commercial boat, which was a signal that they were offloading fish from the slave boats into the commercial boat. We could see the ropes that were tying these two together. We didn't expect to see that. It was unbelievable. We knew we were delivering something that was going to make a difference in this investigation. And the Associated Press brought it to the authorities that agreed to cooperate based on the visual evidence that we had provided. And the Indonesian government used their navy to go out and rescue these men off the boats and arrest the captains that were responsible. Because of this team's investigation, there was the immediate release of the men that were on those boats. But almost more importantly, the level of awareness that went up around that rescue actually cascaded into more rescues of more men and now we know, just based on her reporting and her team, that over 2,000 men have been returned to their homes. Many of the men were gone for decades, had not seen their mothers, had not seen their sisters or brothers. This is one of the rare times, maybe the only time, where we've actually been able to put a face to the lives we've saved. Martha sent me a note recently, and, and in that note, uh, she shared about one of her colleagues going back to visit with some of the men who, who were rescued. She told them the story. And one of them said, you mean a satellite in the sky looking for us? What I hear in that question, looking for us, is that he doesn't even know that he's valued as a human being. And so for me, the reward is about, obviously, him being reunited with his family, but knowing that in some indirect way that we communicated to him that his life had value. 
that's what this is all about. That's the golden image. At its core, that, that is why we do what we do. This is the LC on Channel 1 with Terminal Count Briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint any time after the Terminal Count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on Channel 1, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. FTS LC, verify the hold fire switch is in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. Flight Control, perform launch on time verification. Roger. Launch on time verified. Roger. RC, verify solar radiation acceptable for launch. Verify. LC switch to ready position. All steps are complete prior to the status check. Four minutes to clock restart. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. We remain in the planned 30 minute built in hold as preparations for the launch continue. In a few moments, launch conductor Doug Lebo will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the countdown. 27 engineers and managers will be pulled for system status and readiness to proceed with the launch. This is the final status check before launch for all Atlas vehicle systems, ground systems, payload, and the U.S. Air Force Western Range. The readiness pull includes hydraulics, pad water deluge system, electrical systems, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen as Doug Lebo performs the final polling of the launch team. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems, propulsion. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Has gas. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. Instrumentation. Go. Com. Go. Timer. Go. GCQ. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Facilities. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. AC is go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count, T0 is planned for 18 colon 30 colon 33 Zulu. Set count to start at 18 colon 26 colon 33 Zulu. Roger, T0 is set for 18 colon 30 colon 33 Zulu. Count will start at 18 colon 26. Polling is complete and the team has given the go for launch. 
From T-minus four minutes until launch, you'll be listening to Doug Lebo and his team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. You'll hear the team confirm securing of Atlas liquid oxygen topping, followed by the call to transfer the Atlas and Centaur stages from ground facility power to internal battery power. At T-minus one minute 55 seconds, the team will command the launch sequencer to start, followed shortly by securing the Centaur liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen topping activity. At T-minus 1 minute 40 seconds, the team will command the flight control system to launch enable and arm the flight termination system. In the final minute, the Atlas tanks will be verified at flight pressures followed by verification of the Centaur tank pressures. A final status check of Atlas, Centaur, and Worldview 4 readiness happens at T-minus 25 seconds. Seconds before liftoff, the RD-180 engine ignites and performs a health check before lifting the vehicle off the pad. After liftoff, you'll hear the voice of Marty Malinowski providing us with flight commentary. On my mark, the time will be T minus four minutes and counting. Three, two, one, mark. T minus four minutes and counting. 355. Ground power is enabled. The countdown clock has resumed, and we are go for launch at 10.30.33 Pacific time. Three, securing Alice, hello to Tommy. 250. Alice thanks the flight pressure. FPS internal. One fifty nine. Vehicle internal. One fifty five. Launch sequencer start. One fifty. Securing Centaur LH two. Securing Centaur LO two. One forty. Launch enable. One thirty seven. FPS armed. T minus 90 seconds, the launch vehicle, payload, ground systems, and western range are go for launch. 120. Mark is armed. FCS count started. One ten. Vent valves locked. This is a rock. Range is green. Copy rock. One minute. T minus one minute. Forty. Stable at step three. T 
minus 30 seconds. 25. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Worldview 4. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have RD-180 ignition, and we have liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket carrying Worldview 4 for Digital Globe, doubling the capacity of the world's highest resolution imaging satellite constellation and allowing everyone to see a better world. of Marty Malinowski and providing the launch vehicle and set data. dynamic pressure. Now have passed max Q. RD 180 performance continues to look good. Body rates are controlling down the middle. Booster has throttled back, right on schedule. Signatures look good. Current altitude is 11. Copy. That is 13 miles, downrange distance 5.3 miles, current velocity 1,659 miles per hour. RD-180 continues to perform well, injector pressures look good, as well as M2 pump speed. LH2 tank vent is underway. I have begun Alpha limited stern at this point, and the vehicle is now 50% of its liftoff weight. Navy continues to perform well. Coming RCS pyro valve. That pyro valve has now fired. System is pressurizing to flight levels, and signatures are good. Current altitude is 31 miles, downrange distance 35 miles, current velocity 3,760 miles per hour. And we've completed the Q-alpha limited steering at this point. Roger rates continue to look good. Booster engine continues to Perform well, pump speeds, injector pressure, it's all in band. Booster is now one quarter of its liftoff weight. Booster has begun to throttle to maintain 5G's, constant acceleration. Space cooldown is underway. Now begun throttling to 4.6 G's in preparation for go. Boost space cooldown is complete. And we have engine shutdown. Vico looks good. We have indication of a clean stage separation. Box and fuel pre start on the RL 10. And two purge firing. The RCS is underway. Ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. 
up on fuel frame jettison. And we have indication of a clean jettison. That looks good. Current altitude is 133 miles, downrange distance 263 miles, current velocity 9,768 miles per hour. Centaur PU is currently in its fixed angle position for the early portion of this 11 minute and 16 second burn. RL10 performs looks good. Chamber pressure, locks pump, and full venturi all on band. This is Atlas Mission Control at T plus 5 minutes, 28 seconds. We've just seen the successful liftoff of the Atlas V rocket carrying Worldview 4 for Digital Globe. All systems continue to operate nominally. Our next event, cutoff of the Centaur engine, is scheduled to take place in approximately 11 minutes. So I'm joined now by Tanir Kadanas, Digital Globe's Director of Industry Leadership. It's great to be here, Matt. Well, it's great to have you here, Tanir. So we know that rocket launches and satellites fascinate people, both young and old. Absolutely. And I know Digital Globe did ask some uh, kids to submit some questions about launches, satellites, things like that. So. Um, are you ready to take a few of those, see what we got? I think I am. All right, great. I Let's take a look and see what our first question is. So uh, nine-year-old Colin has asked us, how big is the satellite and what does it weigh? So Worldview 4 is almost 18 feet tall and, and 8 feet wide. Uh, that's about the size of a small playground that has a swing set and monkey bars and a slide, or more like probably the size of a pickup truck, like a Ford 1 F-150. Now, at launch, the satellite weighs about 5,200 pounds or 2.6 tons. That includes approximately 1,000 pounds of fuel. So for comparison, I would say it weighs about as much as an adult elephant does. Great. Good answer there for Colin. Thanks. Let's take a look at our next question that we've got here. Our next question comes from Anthony, who's 14, and he wants to know, what is the lifespan of a satellite? Well, unfortunately, they don't last forever. Uh, so in this case, Worldview 4 will be on orbit about 10 to 12 years. Okay. Let's see. The next question that we got has come in from 13-year-old Oliver, and Oliver wants to know how fast will the satellite travel? flies pretty fast. It's going at 17,000 miles per hour. For comparison, if Oliver's mom or dad were driving down the highway at 65 miles an hour, uh, the satellite is traveling almost 262 times as fast as that car is going down the highway. It's pretty fast. It is. It <laughs> is. All right. Uh, let's see. We had one other question come in from Oliver, and Oliver also wants to know how many people worked on the satellite. You know, that's a hard number to estimate because there's been four main companies involved uh, with building it and almost 20 subcontractors. So I would say from Digital Globe, we estimate that as many as 400 people probably were involved in getting World Before ready. It's amazing between the rocket, the satellites, everything that takes place, how many people actually put their hands it's a tremendous on effort. it. It it's really a tremendous is. tremendous effort. All right. Let's take a look at our next question here. Our next question comes from 10-year-old Evan, who wants to know how you charge the batteries on Worldview 4. It does indeed have batteries uh, to charge. So the satellite, though, has five solar panels. Each panel is about nine feet by four feet wide. Uh, the panels together produce about three and a half kilowatts of energy when it's in full sunshine, uh, which is enough to power a small house, for example. Um, in addition to the pa the panels powering the satellite when it's in full sunshine, they're also charging the batteries at the same time so that when the so that the satellite can actually operate when it's on the dark side of the Earth, which is about 30 minutes during each orbit. Makes sense. All right. Let's see. The next question is coming from six-year-old Ben, and Ben wants to know, does the satellite see Pluto and other planets in <laughs> outer space? Again, a great question. Um, so Worldview 4 does have the capability to see planets. Now, we would obviously need to turn the satellite uh, around to face outer space instead of Earth uh, in order to see them. Uh, but we did check with one of our satellite engineers, and he thought Pluto would probably be too far away to see. Uh, but I think we could definitely see other planets like Mars, Venus, probably even Jupiter as well. Yeah, as long as you could turn it around. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, let's look at our next question here that's come in from Kenzie, who's 12, 
and wants to know if it's really hard to make a satellite or if you've cracked the code and it's really easy now. Well, there's a saying around Digital Globe that space is hard. Uh, so we talked to two of our satellite engineers who worked on building World V4 to answer uh, Kenzie's questions. They both agreed that uh, building satellites is hard, even though we've successfully launched, obviously, several into space. Um, one said that, you know, rocket science is easy since physics and the equations uh, have been around fully for 200 years. But, you know, Matt, you're the rocket engineer and you understand this much better than I do. It's hard, right? Absolutely. Rocket science is hard. Um, you've got gravity to deal with, you've got space to deal with, and all those are very unforgiving. And unlike things that you work on here on Earth, once we launch that rocket, you don't have a chance to go change things, right? You can't pull sure. your car over to the side of the road and tweak some things. Exactly. So it's uh, the amount of focus that has to go into the manufacturing processes, the engineering processes, to Absolutely. make sure that you have the right craftsmanship in that rocket. Um, it's astounding the amount of quality that has to go go into it. So, and to build on what you just said, uh, our other engineer actually quoted NASA's uh, Flight Controller's Creed, which states that there's no substitute for total preparation and complete dedication for space will not tolerate uh, the careless and indifferent. And he said that, you know, this is still true, to, uh, even though we have so much more technological advancement these days. Absolutely. We do these one at a time, and each one has its own unique challenges. Exactly. All right, that's a great question. Let's take a look at our next question from seven-year-old Landon. Uh, and he really has a great question. How much fire does it take to lift a rocket into space? <laughs> well, I know that unlike our cars, the Atlas V rocket doesn't use gasoline. Uh, instead, each of the two stages of the rocket use a mixture of high-tech fuel and oxidizer, right? Yeah, absolutely. So for the Atlas V booster, we use a highly refined kerosene called Rocket Propellant 1, or RP1, as the fuel. And then we have liquid oxygen that's chilled down to minus 298 Oof, degrees uh, for our oxidizer. So you mix things, those things together to get fire out of the booster. And for our, our Centaur upper stage, uh, we have liquid hydrogen at minus 423 mm -hmm. degrees mixed with that liquid oxygen. So very cold propellant that we have to use to be able to get the uh, the fire that we need to get the rocket exactly. where it needs to go. And to make that fire, the Atlas booster tanks hold about 25,000 gallons of RP-1 that you mentioned. That's probably the equivalent of about 400,000 cups of coffee. Uh, and then there's almost 50,000 gallons of liquid oxygen, and that's over a half a million cans of soda uh, for comparison. Now, the Centaur unit, the second mm -hmm. stage that we talked about, those tanks hold about 3,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen and about 4,300 gallons of liquid oxygen. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of very cold fuel to get us where we need to go. Indeed. All right, let's take a look at our next question. Uh, Three-year-old Bryn wants to know if the rocket is pink. Well, <laughs> uh, well, let me answer this this way. There are three main sections of the rocket. So the first stage that we talked about, the booster, it's coated with a copper color uh, so that uh, it can prevent rust. The second stage, called the Centaur that we mentioned, is painted white. And finally, the payload fairing, which holds the Worldview 4 satellite, uh, that's painted white as well. Uh, but Matt, when we've seen the rocket go off, that copper-coated section is white at liftoff. Why is that? Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about that really cold liquid oxygen in that booster tank. Um, and with that very cold tank there, it'll pull the moisture out of the air. It'll, it'll freeze just a, a thin layer of frost. And that's why you get a white looking rocket uh, okay. uh, on the booster at liftoff. There you go. So yeah, good question about uh, the colors that we see when we lift off. All right, let's see. That's a great question. Let's look at our next one here from Evan. Uh, why does the rocket not keep going straight away from the Earth? Uh, so the rocket launches straight up, as we just saw, but eventually it takes a curved path uh, to get the satellite into a circular orbit around Earth. Also, you know, once the boosters stop pushing the rocket and the satellite up, the Earth's gravitational force begins to pull it down. Um, and so it doesn't keep going into space, obviously. Makes sense. See, next question came in, I believe, from 12-year-old Buck, who would like to know, at what altitude is the engine or booster ejected? Mm, that's a really good question. Sounds like uh, Buck may want to be a rocket engineer <laughs> like you someday. Um, the rocket Centaur upper stage separates from uh, the Atlas V booster at about 4 minutes and 9 seconds. And at that time, it's around 84 nautical miles uh, from above the surface of the Earth. Now, after separation, the booster stage actually falls back to Earth and splashes into the uh, Pacific Ocean. And it's great. That was what we just saw from today's launch. We had that fantastic video showing us that uh, did. today. All right, let's look at the next question here from three-year-old Liam, who wants to know how far into space the satellite will go. 
So the satellite will orbit 383 miles above the surface of the Earth. For comparison, I think we saw this earlier in the video. That's like driving from one end of Florida to the other. Yeah, a ways away. Yeah. Let's see. And then last but not least, we have four-year-old Mila who would like to know <laughs> if there are people on the rocket, maybe somebody like Curious George. Well, nope. Uh, sadly, Curious George isn't on board, and uh, neither is probably the man with the yellow hat. <laughs> That's too bad. I know my uh, my six-year-old son would think that'd be pretty interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Tanir, thank you so much. Great job answering those questions. Thanks, Matt. That was really fun. It really was. All right. So um, let's go ahead and get back to the mission now. We'll uh, We'll come back again and get a chance to chat in a few minutes. Great. Had some momentary data recovery there. Bubbles look good. Still in a blackout at this point. At this point, uh, Centaur should be orbital. Data has resumed. Carlton performance, very good. Body rates going down the middle. Main engine, let's listen in to Marty Malinowski. And we have indication of Miko. Shutdown looks good. We have gone to forest signaling. Done the turn. Separation attitude. We just heard confirmation of the successful cutoff of the Centaur main engine. Our next event is Worldview 4 separation, scheduled to take place in about three minutes. Once again, here's Marty Malinowski. Our fuel tank has vented down as planned. Bubbles are stable at this point. You and our turn to spacecraft separation attitude. Auto pressures are stable. Batteries are as well. And we have the Miko 1 plus 3 OPM showing all parameters very close to pre flight predicted actual. Right on schedule for the planned orbit. And Centaur fuel tank has been vented down again. Levels are stable. During completion of the spacecraft separation attitude turn. And we have completed the turn to spacecraft separation attitude. In RCS fairings.
And we have indication of spacecraft separation.